Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. I'd like to begin today with a retraction. Last time I said that Sir Henry Morgan arrived in Port Royal aboard the Jamaica Merchant, and that's not the case. Now, he left England aboard the Jamaica Merchant, but that wasn't the ship that brought him home. It was actually the vessel of a disreputable English privateer that brought him in. Now, this raised a lot of eyebrows in Jamaica. Morgan was, of course, a former buccaneer, an admiral among the Brethren of the Coast, but he'd cast that life off and traded it for a more respectable one, reportedly. Arriving in the company of a crew who were all but outright pirates wasn't the best way to start that new life off. You see, back in London, Morgan had earned a place relatively close to the king. His stories and his demeanor fascinated Charles II and represented to him what England could accomplish in the New World. More to the point, Morgan had made friends in Charles' court that were hugely influential. They were all part of that anti-Catholic, anti-Spanish, pro-war, pro-trade, pro-colonial crowd. Now that's a gross oversimplification. English politics were a lot more complex than our modern-day left-versus-right outlook. For example, that group largely wanted to wrest control of the West Indies away from Spain. At least, they wanted to cut out a larger slice of the pie. However, James, Duke of York, was among that group, and he himself was also a Catholic. Now, the war with the Dutch was winding down, and King Charles, well, he turned his eye to the West. The peace was holding between Spain and England, but only just barely. You see, the language of the Treaty of Madrid was unclear on a number of issues concerning mostly trade, shipping rights, and admission into certain ports. Well, that stuff was causing friction, but in those cases, usually no one died. The real problem was that of the logwood cutters. You see, Spain attacked their camps and brutalized the men there. They began employing privateers who attacked English ships with impunity. They almost always took those ships as a prize. Now, the men on board those ships were arrested and either virtually enslaved or summarily executed. Now, let's not pretend England was innocent here. They'd done exactly that same thing for over a decade now and pretty successfully. But Governor Lynch cried foul that Jamaica was being hurt worse than they'd ever hurt the Spanish, but they really didn't have a position of moral authority here. But then, ships from other English colonies were being targeted as well, and those colonies had no real history of buccaneering. You see, the Spanish considered those logwood cutters pirates, but England, on the other hand, didn't. As pirates, they could be executed without trial and create no diplomatic waves, but if they were laborers for a legitimate industry, well, you couldn't just slit their throats and throw them overboard, and... This was causing a lot of tension in London and Spain. So King Charles took some steps to rectify the situation and improve Jamaica's position in the West Indies. He granted a commission as governor to John Vaughan, the third Earl of Carberry, and named Sir Henry Morgan as his lieutenant governor. He tasked the two men with defending Jamaica, with curtailing piracy, and to see to the prosperity of what was the largest English colony in the West Indies. They would, as it turns out, have very different ideas on exactly how to achieve those goals and what their preferred outcome would be. This is Episode 37, Gentlemen and Scoundrels, Part 2. On February 19th, 1674, the Second Peace of Westminster officially ended hostilities between England and the Netherlands. Now, the Dutch ceded their colony of New Netherland in North America to England, who christened it New York. That'll be important in the years to come. But there's one more facet to that peace that's going to be a lot more important and a lot sooner, and that was a marriage alliance. You see, this marriage wouldn't actually take place until... France and the Netherlands signed a treaty about two years after the Second Peace of Westminster, but Charles arranged at the signing of that Second Peace for his niece, Mary, to wed the Dutch Prince William of Orange. And this is going to be a very big deal. 
We're going to cover it in much greater detail in the months to come, but let's take a closer look for just a second. Now, Mary was the niece of King Charles II, and she was the second daughter of his brother, James, Duke of York. Now, that made her the granddaughter of King Charles I. Now, her fiancé, Prince William of Orange, was... Well, first of all, do you remember William the Silent? We talked about him a long time ago at some length during the Dutch Revolt and the outset of the Eighty Years' War. He was the stadtholder of Zeeland, the leader of the Dutch Revolution, and he was the lord of Nassau and Orange. That was the man that it was rumored for a while that Queen Elizabeth was going to marry. Well, this current William of Orange was his great-grandson, but more to the point, his mother was Mary Henrietta, Princess Royal of England and Princess of Orange. She was the eldest daughter of King Charles I, who married into that Dutch house. That makes this current William of Orange also the grandson of King Charles I. And that makes William and Mary first cousins. Yeah, they did that kind of thing a lot back then. But more importantly, both of these two were equally descended from King Charles I, who was a good Protestant king, and they themselves were devout Protestants. That's really the relevant information here, and like I said, this will be very, very important later on. With all that out of the way, though, and the war finally over, Charles sent Earl Vaughn and Sir Henry Morgan to Jamaica to set the place aright. Now, Vaughn wasn't actually his first choice for governor. That was one Lord Carlisle, but he turned the appointment down. That made Vaughn the second pick, which graded him a bit. He was also about five years younger than his lieutenant governor, and he struggled to assert his authority over the older, better-looking, and more popular Henry Morgan. Almost immediately, things began to go awry between them. You see, back in England, Vaughn and Morgan had the opportunity to suss each other out, and neither liked what they saw. Morgan saw in Vaughn a gentlemanly, stiff-necked prig, a by-the-book stickler that expected things done exactly his way, which, you know, he was. Now, Vaughn saw in his lieutenant governor a rogue and a scoundrel. He saw a man who threw rules and propriety out the window. He was a maverick, a shoot-first-and-ask-questions-later kind of guy. Basically, what I'm saying here is if they'd been willing to work together, it could have been the most awesome lethal weapon buddy cop pirate movie ever made. In a world where chaos reigns supreme, Terror ruled on the high seas. Only two men could be trusted to save the world. All they had to do was team up. One last time. He was a freewheeling freebooter, and he was Mr. Law and Order. And together, they were two men and a baby. Yeah, there, there wasn't a baby. You don't bring the baby in until, like, the second sequel at the earliest. In the first sequel, you introduce the love interest, and then in the next movie, you introduce the baby to spice things up a bit. It's basic science. And no, they didn't team up. They grated at each other every time they met. One point of contention was the clause in Morgan's commission that stated that he could act as governor while Vaughn was off the island. Vaughn wasn't happy about this, and he didn't want to give Morgan the chance to serve even as acting governor for a short time where he could shore up his own support. Now, they were set to sail for Jamaica on two separate ships, so Vaughn ordered Morgan and Captain Knapman of the Jamaica Merchant to ensure that the two ships stayed within sight of each other. When they put to sea, the Jamaica Merchant immediately lost sight of Vaughn's frigate. It was probably intentional. Maybe it was simply Morgan asserting his independence, or maybe it was something more nefarious. Morgan claimed simply... 
quote, their anchor was so fast in the ground, his excellency in the frigate was got about the foreland, and they could not see him after, end quote. But the Jamaica merchant made the crossing in six weeks, which was much faster than Vaughn's frigate. She was a smaller and lighter ship, and her captain was an experienced seaman, which makes what happens next all the more suspicious. They were cruising along the coast of Hispaniola, surprisingly close to the shore, when their ship ran aground. They didn't wreck on the coast, though. They hit a sandbar off the Isla Avacha, also known as Cow Island. Now this... This is what's so suspicious. Not only were they in the hands of a skilled ship's master, Morgan himself knew just where they were. Cow Island was an old haunt of his. Nearly every raid he'd ever undertaken started at Cow Island. Buccaneer crews had been using it as staging grounds for years now. It's highly unlikely that such a well-known and, frankly, obvious piece of land would catch the ship by surprise, so for years historians have speculated on exactly what happened. Stefan Talty mentions the evidence that, quote, Morgan himself whipped the crew on to leave Vaughn in his wake, end quote. Terry Breverton suggests that Morgan, quote, wanted to meet someone at his favorite rendezvous, end quote. Graham A. Thomas brings up another point. He writes, quote, Some theories suggest that Morgan wanted to collect some buried treasure on the island, end quote. And Thomas also mentions that there was another notable passenger on board the Jamaica merchant, and he may have had a substantial financial interest in that ship running aground. Now, it's a stretch, but Breverton writes, quote, Modiford wanted the ship wrecked to claim insurance upon it. Two men in a world. The dynamic duo is back. Morgan and Modi Ford are together again for an all new adventure on the high seas. I promise that'll be the last time, I swear. But yeah, apparently Modi Ford was on the same ship as Morgan on his way to Port Royal. Captain Knapman had questions of his own on just what happened there on Cow Island. Now, he may have been covering his own tracks here, but he wrote, quote, An account of the unfortunate loss of the Jamaica merchant on 25 February on the east side of the Isle of Ash on the south side of Hispaniola, within 24 hours of this port. Knows not what evil genius led him there, and never was any man more surprised considering the course they steered. Saved all people, and five or six days after, one Captain Thomas Rogers, a Jamaica privateer now sailing under the French, carried Sir Henry Morgan and all the passengers for Jamaica. End quote. So Morgan hitched a ride to Jamaica with an English privateer in the employ of the French. It stretches credulity to believe that Morgan somehow got a message from London to Tortuga to ask an old friend to pick him up on that day, whipped the crew of his ship across the Atlantic at a breakneck pace, purposefully crashed her, dug up some buried treasure, got picked up by an old friend, made contact with the Brethren of the Coast sailing out of Tortuga, returned to Jamaica, collected the insurance on the ship along with Modi Ford, and spent the days he had as acting governor before Vaughn arrived, establishing himself as the shadowy crime lord, running an intricate network of Caribbean piracy out of Port Royal under the nose of the authorities of which he himself was now a very prominent member. But that seems to be what Captain Knapman was suggesting, at least insofar as the wreck was concerned. The evil genius he mentioned was almost certainly meant to be Morgan, and that's what more than a few of Morgan's contemporaries believed as well. First, Morgan arrived in Port Royal, aboard that privateer vessel. That's when all of the cutthroats and buccaneers, all the old-time brethren, all of the prostitutes and green boys of Port Royal would have gathered to see him. That's when William Dampier, fresh off his disappointing stint as a plantation manager, would have glimpsed Morgan and heard tales of his exploits, often from men that actually lived them. Now, Morgan had about a week before Vaughn arrived. What clandestine activities he might have gotten up to, we will never know. We could wildly speculate that he was sending his secretary to meet with buccaneer captains, that he was writing letters intended for the seedier parts of Tortuga, and that he was gathering select Port Royal merchants to discuss the river 
of contraband that was about to flood Port Royal, and how to do so avoiding the eyes of the governor. But we can't know that. We do know that he saw his wife, after three years away from her, and that he met with the Council of Jamaica to be installed as lieutenant governor, and the powers of acting governor given over to him. Now, he informed Lynch of his replacement. I like to imagine that it was actually Modi Ford that had the honor to give Lynch the news, but Modi Ford himself was installed as chief justice on the island, which was a position of no small power. Then Morgan pulled out all the stops in preparing Port Royal to receive her new governor. He saw Fort Charles cleaned up. He saw English bunting hung up everywhere, and he had all the guns brought to bear facing the city. Not, like, aimed at the city or anything, but in preparation for a salute. He called in the militia. He drilled them, and he gave them marching orders for when the governor arrived. Vaughn, it seemed, was to be greeted in high military fashion. Now, it seems to me that this serves two purposes. First, it showed Vaughn respect after the slight at being left behind on the voyage, and it proved that Morgan was already set about his royal appointed duties. Second, though, it showed Vaughn just how quickly Morgan could move when he had a mind to, and the kind of influence he commanded in Port Royal. It showed how he could ready the militia, the fort, get the guns ready, and get every ship ready for a military welcome in just a couple of days. What could he do if Vaughn turned against him? Would the island rise up against their new governor if Morgan ordered it? It appeared that this was a dangerous place for the new governor, and Morgan was giving him just another reason why. Now, Lord Vaughn was many things, but Stupid wasn't one of them. He understood the slight Morgan had shown him, and probably he understood the hidden threat as well. But rather than let the pirate have his way, Vaughn immediately set to securing his own base of power on the island. It was on 17 March 1675 when John Vaughn, 3rd Earl of Carberry, met with the Council of Jamaica, and the minutes of the meeting read, quote, his Excellency's instrument of government under the great seal read, the oaths of allegiance and supremacy administered to him by five of the council according to His Majesty's command, also the oath of Captain General and Governor-in-Chief of this island. End quote. This meant John Vaughn was the new governor. Now is it just me, or is the position of Governor of Jamaica starting to feel a little like the defense against the dark arts professor at Hogwarts? I mean, Hogwarts had a new professor every year, and all of them were either evil or incompetent or suffered terribly in the position. And Jamaica couldn't hold on to a governor for more than a couple of years. Now, this is probably because England wasn't willing to invest the resources to fix what was wrong in Jamaica. The island was too remote and too wild and too fixed in a system built around piracy for them to want to. They actually expected the governors to invest a substantial portion of their own money in the island. It operated kind of like a franchise, really. Like, you get the flag and the name, and then you get a set of rules to follow. Now, you have to meet our standards, but you have to invest all of your own capital. Don't expect any help from us, but break any of the rules and we will shut you down immediately. But Vaughn, being a good royal man, believed in the system. However, he did have a few roadblocks to overcome immediately. First, there were the stores of powder. They were almost empty. There were only a few barrels of powder left on the whole island. When he wrote the Lords of Trade about it, they responded that that was his responsibility now. I imagine that Morgan firing all of the cannon in the fortress and ordering the militia to fire their guns in salute was even more grating now. Second, though, there was the question of the books. Lynch hadn't been keeping the best records of his finances. There turned out to be a few irregularities. For example, Lynch had granted a ship, the Thomas and Francis, commission to attack the Dutch. This was back during the war, and it was totally acceptable. But they took a Dutch prize containing several hundred slaves and brought it back to Port Royal, where they sold the slaves at auction. This was widely known in the town, but no record of it was kept in the governor's account. Now, the governor was owed a piece of every slave sold, of any other booty that was on board the ship, and of the ship itself. And then, so was the king, 
and the Lord High Admiral, his brother, but there wasn't a record of any such payments being accepted or made. It appeared, to Vaughn at least, that the corrupting influence of Port Royal had gotten its hooks even into Governor Thomas Lynch. But that was all sorted out without anyone having to be arrested, all the money was found, and Vaughn was satisfied. Now, within a few weeks, the island's finances were all put in order. Morgan was seen to her defenses, and everything seemed to be running smoothly, so Vaughn could now turn to his primary goal. His job was to succeed where Lynch had failed at curtailing English piracy in the West Indies. Now, Port Royal wasn't home to an armada of buccaneer ships like it had been when Modiford ran the show. They all knew well enough to stay away at this point, but hundreds of English vessels were now sailing from Tortuga, flying French colors and carrying French letters of mark. See, France and the Netherlands were still at war, even though England had pulled out of the war, and they were granting commissions to privateers of any nation, left and right. Now, there were two problems with this. First, Despite their French flags, every time an English ship was captured by the Allied Spanish and Dutch forces, the English ambassador to Spain was required to present an apology and a defense, and this was straining relations. Second, though, despite their French commissions, the goods taken by those English buccaneers were still finding their way into Port Royal. Now, not by the harbor. The buccaneers knew to stay well clear of Port Royal, but by clandestine meeting places up and down the coast. This was illicit black market contraband being sold in broad daylight in English territory. And this meant that neither the English government at Port Royal, where this contraband was being sold, nor the French government of Tortuga, where the letters of mark originated, were getting their cut of the profits. This strained relations with the French, and it upset Vaughan and the council, this was out-and-out -out piracy, and Vaughn suspected that he knew just who was behind it. Sir Henry Morgan was the lieutenant governor, and he sat on the Council of Jamaica as well. He owned two plantations on the island, and he was negotiating the purchase of a third. He owned an estate in Spanish Town. He had a wife and a home. He was a knight, and he had friends in London that vouched for his honor. And still... Still, he chose to while away his days in Port Royal's Kill Devil Taverns, drinking the rawest rum available with the lowliest sort of people. He sang and caroused and shared old war stories with the captains of ships with a vile reputation. These were men who'd sailed on Portobello and Maracaibo and Panama. Now, these days, they mostly sail for the Bay of Campeche to trade with the logwood cutters there, and occasionally they would take up a French commission when they thought they could get away with it. Now, Vaughn knew that Morgan had his fingers in every part of the lingering pirate menace. He just needed to be patient and wait for the proof. Almost immediately, Morgan gave him that proof. He wrote in a letter to one of his old brethren lieutenants, a man named Captain John Edmonds, that the buccaneers would, quote, be very welcome in any harbor, end quote, and that he would have as much, quote, privilege as he can in reason expect, end quote. And that letter fell into Vaughn's hands. Then, to make matters worse, was the letter from the governor of Tortuga to Morgan's brother-in-law, Robert Bindloss, this was a letter asking for the money that was rightly owed him by those English privateers out of Tortuga selling their goods in Port Royal. The French governor granted Bindloss power of attorney in these matters, which, to Vaughan, proved his connection to the pirates, and then this letter fell into Vaughan's hands as well. So Lord Vaughan wrote the Lords of Trade concerning Morgan's fitness to take the office of governor, should he himself die or take ill. Then, a few months later, Vaughn wrote again, and this time he didn't mince words. He said, concerning Morgan, he was, quote, Every day more convinced of his imprudence and unfitness to have anything to do in civil government, and of what hazards the island may run by so dangerous a succession. Sir Henry has made himself and his authority so cheap at the port, drinking and gambling in the taverns, that Lord Vaughan intends to remove thither speedily himself for the reputation of the island and security of that place, though he pretends it is only to change the air, having lately had a fever. End quote. 
So he had real hard evidence in his hand. He believed he had Morgan dead to rights, and he made his move against the old pirate. He called a meeting of the council, including all of the most important people in Jamaica, as well as Bindloss and Morgan. The first order of business was his accusation against Morgan. Now, this wasn't a trial, not officially, but to call it anything else would be a lie. Vaughn produced copies of the letters he'd confiscated and presented them to the council. He claimed that Morgan, quote, endeavors to set up privateering and has obstructed all my designs and purposes for the reducing of those that do use that curse of life, end quote. See, what angered Vaughn the most here, what he brought up over and over again, was Morgan's unfitness to serve as lieutenant governor and his attempts to undermine Vaughn's own actions. He thought that Morgan's influence weakened his own, and now he may have been right, but being popular isn't a crime. Vaughn, though, saw things differently. Graham A. Thomas writes in his book, The Pirate King, quote, During his time as governor, Vaughn behaved as if he was the king of Jamaica. He believed that the government should reflect the government of England. It had an assembly, a council, and the governor, the king's representative in Jamaica, and that made him king of the island in his eyes, end quote. So during the trial, Vaughn railed at Morgan for hours. He examined him, he questioned him, and he even called witnesses. He called in Morgan's secretary, and then he called in his brother-in-law, Bindloss, and he called in anyone he could get into the council chamber that might have anything to say about Morgan. He grilled Morgan, he raked him over the coals. And Morgan? Well, he answered calmly. He scoffed at the accusations, and he gave a clear, concise explanation for all of his actions. By the end of the day, it was clear that Morgan had come out unscathed and Vaughn was just wasting everybody's time. You see, he wasn't a king. He was a representative of the king, sure, but little more than really an administrator. He didn't have the power to remove Morgan. The council didn't have that power. The king had granted Morgan his commission, and only Charles, through the Lords of Trade, could remove Morgan from his seat. So Morgan sat comfortably in his position. He grew comfortable enough to grow even more bold. In addition to his position as lieutenant governor and council member, Morgan sat on the Admiralty Court there in Jamaica. Bindloss sat on it as well, as did Major William Beeston, that pirate hunter under Governor Lynch. Now, Governor Vaughn sat at the court's head, but rarely took the time to attend, which left Morgan in charge. Unlike the council meetings, this was a job that Morgan seemed to enjoy, or at least it was a job that he occasionally deigned to attend. On one such occasion, he was hearing the case of a slaver carrying 300 slaves into Port Royal. Vaughn ordered the ship inspected, and he found that the captain didn't have the proper authority from the Royal African Company to trade in slaves, so he seized the ship. He arrested the crew, and he sent them to the Admiralty Court for Morgan to hear the case. Morgan threw the case out. No questions asked. Vaughn was furious with him, and he ordered a new trial at which he would be present. Then there was the time a local buccaneer named John Coxon was spotted in the waters near Port Royal. Coxon was a known pirate, and Vaughn had vowed to annihilate piracy, so he decided to deal with the man probably on the advice of Morgan, who had intimate knowledge of the buccaneers, Vaughn sent word to the crew of Coxon's ship that if they turned over their captain and surrendered, they would be pardoned and allowed to return to Port Royal. Of course, this failed miserably. All it did was announce Vaughn's intentions to arrest Coxon and lose him the element of surprise. By the time a ship was finally sent to collect, the pirate was long gone. In what was probably a misguided attempt to rectify his decision to allow Morgan to head the Admiralty Court, Vaughn decided to sit in at the next major trial to come before them. Of course, he couldn't afford to look weak, not in front of this cabal of old-time Jamaican gentry who'd for so many years been enmeshed in piracy. Now he heard the case of one John Dean, captain of the privateer vessel St. David, he was accused by Captain John Yardley of intercepting his merchant vessel, John Adventure, and drinking, quote, 
several pipes of wine and taken away a cable, value 100 pounds sterling. End quote. This wasn't piracy, by any measure. It was a weak hook for Vaughn to hang his hat on. It was a poor choice for him to use as an example, but not to be daunted by such trivialities as facts and the law, Vaughn found John Dean guilty of piracy on the high seas, and he sentenced him to death. This was way out of line, and it far exceeded the crime. At most, Captain Yardley expected recompense for his wine and cable, and maybe a lashing, certainly not a death sentence. He personally decried the verdict, and he wasn't alone. Locals all over the island cried out in anger and shock. Now privateers, surely, but merchant seamen as well, and land-based merchants and farmers and even the council. This was a ridiculous death sentence and totally unacceptable. Luckily, especially for Captain Dean, Vaughn didn't have the power to order a death sentence on his own. He had to submit the evidence and his findings to the Lords of Trade. They, with the king's authority, had to accept a governor's ruling before it could be carried out. If not for this fact, things might have turned ugly right there. The people weren't literally up in arms, but, you know, figuratively. And if they'd tried to execute Dean, it could possibly have turned violent. Vaughn, for his part, blamed Morgan and Bindloss for the unrest. He believed that they'd roused the rabble personally to weaken his position as governor. It was all a conspiracy in his mind. In truth, though, it was his own incompetence and tyrannical rule that led to the anger in the streets. So John Dean was left in his cell to suffer and to await word of his fate. But that wasn't the last of Vaughn's troubles. He was awaiting word of his accusation against Lieutenant Governor Morgan and his decision in the case of Captain Dean when it came to his attention that another privateer ship under Captain James Brown was selling slaves in the town. Brown had captured a Dutch slaver and sold the about 100 men and women on board in Port Royal. Now this seemed like a much more clear-cut case of piracy than the slaver operating without a license, and Vaughn ordered the slaves returned to their Dutch masters. Brown was long gone by this point, but Vaughn ordered him apprehended if ever he returned. Tempers still hadn't cooled over the John Dean affair, but what's worse the slaves he ordered returned were already bought and paid for. The planters did not want to give them back, so they rebelled. They marched and they demonstrated, and they prepared to protest the verdict with violence, if need be. And then, something came in and overshadowed everything going on in Port Royal. Word of an attack on the Spanish town of Santa Marta came to Port Royal. A small fleet of privateers flying French colors with a French commission under Captain Pierre Lagarde raided the small city. Now they entered the city at dawn and immediately took the church. This was a common tack. From there, the men swarmed out, searching for plunder and women and wine and captives. The usual buccaneer depredations took place. They defiled the church. There were murders. There were rapes. There were tortures. There was theft. Now, it wasn't anything like Morgan's raids, and nowhere near Lolone, but it was a bad day for the people of Santa Marta. They took the bishop and the governor hostage, though, and they held them for ransom. Then, the Armada de Barlovento arrived on the horizon. The hostages were now, at this point, possibly the only thing that could keep these freebooters safe from that kind of force. So, the buccaneer force took the hostages and sailed away at top speed. Now, here's where the problem for Vaughn comes in. While that privateer fleet had been flying French colors and under a French commander, two of the ships among them were crewed and captained by Englishmen. The first was Captain William Barnes. He was a privateer back during the war who had accepted a French commission, as had so many others when England left the war. He was identified right before the raid by Governor Sir William Stapleton of the Leeward Islands as operating a vessel, quote, with 12 guns and 150 men. But then that second Englishman was John Coxon. That was the very same man who had gotten away from Vaughan about a year prior. For an Englishman to accept that French commission 
wasn't exactly illegal, but it wasn't approved of either. It left the privateers in a sort of legal limbo that nobody wanted to touch. And more to the point, when Governor Vaughn found out about the raid, it was because there were, to quote Sir Thomas Lynch, five or six French and English privateers lately come to Jamaica from taking Santa Marta, Barnes being one and Coxon expected every hour. On board, the governor and the bishop and Captain Lagarde has promised to put them on shore. The plunder of the town was not great, money and broken plate about twenty pound a man. End quote. Yeah, the buccaneers had shown up in Port Royal. Now this looked bad for Vaughn. He was supposed to be tough on piracy. He was the law and order governor, and here was a fleet of pirate ships carrying two high-profile Spanish prisoners seeking sanctuary in his city. And I suppose that makes a lot of sense. I mean, Port Royal was the closest city to which the Armada wouldn't follow the pirates, and likely that saved their lives. But it was a gamble. Lynch was likely as not to execute them. He had to make a decision on just how to proceed. If he offered sanctuary, it would look to Spain like Jamaica was still harboring pirates, quite literally. If he didn't, that would be declaring those privateers outright pirates and deeply offend the French. Potentially, that would also lose them their only defensive naval force against France, which, actually, there were a lot of rising tensions between them, so they needed to keep the privateers happy. So Vaughn allowed Coxon to come ashore. He brought with him the bishop and a friar they had hostage as well. They gave them a house that had all of the niceties and amenities that they could wish for, and they gave them the official apologies of the governor and the king. But there were still other hostages on board the pirate ships. Vaughn sent out a ship to, quote, procure the liberty of the governor and others, but finding all privateers drunk, it was impossible to persuade them to do anything by fair means, end quote. This put the council in a very delicate position. They had to take some kind of a position on what was clearly outright piracy, even if they had a foreign commission. So the council passed a law stating that it was illegal for an English ship hailing from Port Royal to accept a letter of mark from any foreign power and attack the property of a nation with which England was at peace. They could still accept that commission, but they could not attack anyone with whom England was at peace. They gave the privateers about a three-month grace period for any ships to come in and accept a pardon under the new law, after which time anyone in violation of that law would be executed for piracy. This saved the life of John Coxon and the rest of the buccaneer fleet. They were all allowed to return to their ships, and the French comrades were told to leave English waters immediately on pain of death. Then, after word of the new law spread, a stream of buccaneers began returning to Port Royal. They'd been granted clemency, and then Modiford and Morgan were back in town, so it seemed like everything might just be returning to normal. Plus, English tensions with France were building pretty quickly, so Tortuga was becoming less and less friendly all the time. Then, Captain James Brown sailed into town to accept the governor's pardon. Vaughn had him arrested and imprisoned. This duel between Lord Vaughn and basically everyone else on the island had been heating up for months. They argued over everything. They argued over John Dean and James Brown and John Cox and Henry Morgan. The planters, the slavers, the merchants, the pirates, everyone seemed against Lord Vaughn. And then the day came when Captain James Brown was marched to the gallows. The council called an emergency meeting. They argued that Brown was covered by the pardon, but Vaughn overruled them. The council sent a writ of habeas corpus to Vaughn, which he ignored. They wrote a stay of execution, and Vaughn dissolved the council. Then he hung James Brown. The governor had stepped too far this time. He was formally censured by the council, which he had no power to dissolve in the first place despite his proclamation, but then a letter arrived from Whitehall. The Lords of Trade had met, and they discussed the cases set before them concerning Jamaica. They ruled that there was no evidence with which to convict Captain John Dean of piracy. 
He was to be freed immediately. There was also no evidence that Sir Henry Morgan was conspiring with known pirates. He was to be commended for his good work there in Jamaica. The governor overstepped his authority in condemning James Brown to death, they said. He did not have the power to do so, nor was he in his rights to ignore the council and attempt to dissolve the body. Effective immediately, John Vaughn, 3rd Earl of Carberry, was removed from the office of governor and ordered to return to England post-haste. His last action as governor was to slash Henry Morgan's salary by half, and then he left the island forever. That hardly mattered to Morgan, though. He owned three successful plantations that made him a very rich man, and he was almost certainly receiving some of the -the off-the-books cash from his many, many contacts within the buccaneer ranks. I mean, of course Vaughn was right. He was just too arrogant and too stupid to play the game by Jamaican rules. And what's more, Morgan wouldn't be receiving that lieutenant governor's salary anymore anyway. With Vaughn on his way back to England, and no replacement there in town, Sir Henry Morgan was named the governor of the Jamaica colony. I'd like to express my deep and sincere thanks to all of the historians who spend years in the trenches doing the hard work without whom I could not do this show. For those who have chronicled the life of Henry Morgan specifically, I would like to thank Alexander Exquemelin and his memory, Alexander Pope and his memory, Stephen Talty, Graham A. Thomas, and Harry Breverton. If you'd like to learn more about Henry Morgan, I cannot recommend highly enough picking up one of their books and giving it a thorough read. My two favorite are The Pirate King by Graham A. Thomas and Empire of Blue Water by Stephen Talty. They're kind of like, well, if you saw last week on Game of Thrones when Professor Slughorn was talking to Samuel Tarley in the library about these two historians, one of whom was extremely accurate but also very dry, the other of whom was very romantic but half of it was entirely made up fantasy, well... Those two books, one of them is quite a clinical account, and the other one is full of romance and adventure. Still, I recommend picking up either of them for a good read. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd also like to thank everybody who has supported the show, either by signing up for Patreon or leaving us a review at iTunes or wherever it is you listen to the show. We couldn't do this show without each and every one of you. Thank you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out already, why not do so over at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com, or you can check us out on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, or YouTube. Most importantly, and as always, thank you for listening.